and welcome to the Sunderland review slash reaction or whatever you want to call it show. Um, Sunderland's season finally came to a drain and end yesterday, losing 3-2 on aggregate to Lincoln City, despite a 2-1 win and all of our hopes being raised at half time. We reacted straight away after the game on Wednesday, but I think it was only fair that we all gave ourselves a little bit of a, should we say, good night's sleep to settle and relax and kind of assess it correctly, shall we say, this morning. So hopefully... Even though it's not an immediate reaction, you'll still enjoy today's show as best as you can. Uh, with me, as he has been for the last three shows, is the knowledgeable, the lovely, and the understandably happy Times Digital Sports Editor, Tom Clark. Tom, how are you doing? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, you're saying about relaxing and you know letting things sink in. I still feel the same sickness I felt mainly for the most of the most of the match yesterday. Um, it's not quite sunk in yet, partly because of the nature of the topsy turvy game that was yesterday. Um, and yeah, just they're just not fun how they play offs, even when you win. I'm not trying to say that to try and wind any Sunderland fans up. It's just it's such an unpleasant experience watching those kind of games. It's never fun. No, I understand, I understand what you mean. I remember the Portsmouth game. I was like buzzing that we got that nil nil draw and won the first like one nil. I was like brilliant. Oh shit! Now we've got Charlton. <laughs> it's like the immediate like oh like we've actually achieved nothing. We've just got a little bit further in this horrendous competition that exists. Um, so I get where you're coming from. And uh, second of all, Ian makes his review debut, but I'm sure regular listeners will recognise your dulcet Scottish tones. Ian, <laughs> stupid question, but how are you feeling in general? Um, yeah, I'm good, mate. And actually, I'm I'm feeling fine um, there this morning because, to be honest, I'm, I'm just glad it's over. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, <laughs> there's a sense of that, isn't there? I think someone said yesterday, um, and it's very much trying to look in the positive light, but someone went, but if we went up, is it a bit like, you know, like 1998 when we were all gutted that we got beat of Charlton in the final and then realistically it was better for us to go up the season later? I think someone said it might be that case that we get rid of a few of these players where we set, you know, we, we get a proper summer in place and so on and so forth. But I, I wish football in Sunderland was that easy, but I'm going to pretend it is for the next couple of days so that mm-hmm. I've got a bit of positivity in my veins Uh We'll get straight to it. We'll get to the game. Um, I was there yesterday, hence my voice being a little bit blown out. It doesn't sound as bad as I thought, but honestly, I've got a frog right in my throat. It's not great. Um, I think anyone who was at the game probably heard how much we we roared them on, which is great. But um, I'll come to you first, Tom, um, because I'm interested, obviously, from a LinkedIn perspective. How do you assess the game from yesterday? Absolutely remarkable. Um, it, It went from the worst performance of our season so far in the first half, not not to take anything away from you guys, but we just didn't turn up at all. Um, I felt we got bullied. And also some of the things we talked about in the previous shows, young lads getting overwhelmed by 10,000 at Stadium of Light. I think that definitely came into play. Our passing was off. And to go from that, and at halftime, I was texting mates, texting my dad saying, this is going down without even throwing a punch um, at the minute. To, to coming back into it was just just remarkable. I think from a Lincoln point of view, and as we discussed on the preview show, it was a great example of why 2-0 is a funny lead in the first in the first leg going into a second leg. Because for Michael Appleton, it was very much a kind of stick or twist. And he went for it and played that extra attacker and it just didn't work. You were all over us, dominating the midfield. And the team that actually came out in the second half with the two changes that he made was, I think, the team that a lot of Lincoln fans would have wanted him to play from the start with an extra midfielder in Conor McGrandall's more experience at the back um, with Joe Walsh, but and it was it was a great, it was it was just really pleasing to see us show some character and show some fight and turn it around. Just even though it was only really twenty minutes, and then it was back to the back to the wall stuff again. Um, but I, I mean, I'd be interested in what you guys thought. You obviously could have been out of sight by half time. Um, mm-hmm. Chance for White could argue that you could have had a penalty. I mean, I thought it was a pen when I saw it. Um, yeah, the Palmer challenge, but I, I was, I was interested because I thought when we missed the penalty, I thought you guys would come again in the same way that you did in the first half, and it didn't quite, it wasn't quite the same. It, I don't know whether it's because we had changed the system, but that intensity wasn't there quite the same. You'd seem to have almost yeah. looked, like psyched yourselves out of it or something. I, I couldn't quite work it out. I'm, obvi- I was obviously delighted, but I was terrified when we missed that pen. That I was like, that that was the chance. It's, they'll come again now. And it wasn't quite the same intensity. Well, when it came, I, I said to the lad next to me, I says, I says, to be fair, this is probably the end if they scored it, obviously. 
says, but if we save this, you've got like 30, well, 29, 28 minutes just to like have a go at them. The, the momentum's in your favor. And when he saves it, I give the seat in front of me a really good punch about eight or nine times with sheer delight, which was great mm. to be honest, but my fists hurt a bit now. Um, but it didn't really swing back. I mean, those, those chances, I said, you know, there's a, there's two or three chances left in this for us. And obviously McGeady hitting the post, O'Brien had a couple of chances, but um, I remember seeing you, you tweeted half time. I went quickly on Twitter to update uh, my girlfriend of the score because she was at work. And I seen your tweet saying like, oh, I can't believe that, you know, this, this, this is it. We're going down that lane of glove on them. And I'm not going to lie, Tom. I was like, fuck off, Tom. Stop this at half time. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, and I, I, I don't mind praising other teams at all. Um, but I, I do think, I think we ran out of steam a bit second half and we probably should have been out of sight in the first half, if we're honest. And I do agree with you. I think it was a penalty. However, that's credit Lincoln. You, you came out and did a, you played really well second half and, I, and no one seen that coming. Like um, one of my, one of my bosses was at the match um, covering the game and, and he said, I, I don't see how Lincoln get back into this it's too good. And then literally like 25 minutes later, he said, you've got to give credit to Apple and, and, and Lincoln for coming back into it. And, and you do really, but um, Ian, uh, some of them perspective is obviously different as we both know. Um, but what's your, what's your overriding feelings on it? Like less than 24 hours later. Um, I think overall, actually that the, the game sums us up in um, their league one overall, you know, I can't, you know, after three, um, their seasons now. I I can only think of a of a handful of um, their sort of matches where we've actually, you know, killed the, the game off. Yeah, so, and it so feels like it came at the Jack Ross era as well, doesn't it? At the start of the Jack Ross era when we had Macho yeah. and someone put the chances away. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. exactly. So you know, us going, you know, sort of two nil up, and and obviously as a you know, Sunderland fan, I'm like, yeah, come on. You know, we're in it now. You know, we can go on. It was you know, Dreamland, you know. wasn't it? It was Dreamland from a yeah. Sunderland perspective. You said we need to do this and we did it. Yeah, but, but you know, to be honest, you know, Lincoln, you know, you know, coming back, you know, scoring, you know, you know, keeping the game wide, wide sort of open there, that just actually really sums up Sunderland in, in you know, League, League One, you know, to be honest. I don't know if it felt like this to, to both of you, really. Um, but first half, I actually said, I mean, between me and you, Tom, and, and me, me and Ian and you, Tom, sorry, we don't really rate Callum McFadgen much um, <laughs> for kind of obvious reasons. I think that's been kind. Um, he hasn't had the greatest of seasons, but he he did well first half. And I kind of went to the lad next to me. I says, I haven't even noticed that he's had a bad game. He's done well getting forward. He's, he's given room to McGeady. But it seemed like second half, it wasn't just a change in your personnel. Um, it felt like, to me, you also pinpointed the left-hand side because for the first 15 minutes, it was just sheer joy. I mean, I, I'm not going to criticise McGeady because we wouldn't have scored two goals without him. Um, and he's still our best player. Hopefully he stays, in my opinion. Um, but it felt like that left-hand side was like, well, McGeady doesn't, he's not the best at tracking back and defending. That's not his game. And that McFadgen is wide open. It felt like our left-hand side, your, obviously your right-hand side, just pinpointed that second half and you'd gone, go at it. I mean, did you see that as well? Or was that just me worrying about McFadden? No, I think you're right. I was watching it with a friend um, who hadn't watched us all season and he kept saying, that's where you can maybe get at them. Maybe McGeady doesn't track enough. Obviously, as you say, without him would have been a diff- different game. But hmm. yeah, it did seem to work that way. I do wonder as well, though, whether that actually was the plan in the first half, but they just didn't execute because they were trying to push Regan Poole forward, our right back, even in the first half. And that's actually where the first goal came from. Alex Palmer, our goalkeeper, trying to kick it to him for a flick on and he misses the header and then um, you guys can attack. <clears throat> I just think it was a case of execution. So it was just a very good team talk, clearly, by Michael Appleton that whipped them into shape. And we suddenly started. The passes were cleaner. The first touches were better. Um, we were winning those second balls that in the first half we were nowhere near you. We were just completely bullying us. Um so I think it was just a case of them maybe more pointedly targeting that area. Yeah, I think you're right. But actually, I wouldn't have been surprised if that was the game plan all along and they just didn't execute it at all in the first half. Yeah. And I think um, I'm obviously very biased, but I do really want to point out the fans, me being there, were magnificent yesterday. Um, I know there's a small section of fans that let themselves down after the game. That's, I'm not labouring on that. The, the bulk of fans were absolutely phenomenal yesterday. Um 
I was within it, so it always going to sound loud. But but Tom, how well did the atmosphere come across on their TV? Is it a neutral fan? It was. It seemed very very intimidating. I was I was worried within the first two two minutes. You know the kind of boos that were coming round when our players were touching the ball. I was thinking this is going to be tough. You know they're a young young squad, and I think you could see it in some, as I say in the passing in the movement. It wasn't the, the confidence wasn't there. You know they're a young group of lads. I said to you before on one of the preview shows that it would go one of two ways: either they'd be completely intimidated by it, or they might go, "Hey, I fancy this. Let's show them what we can do." But it completely it was proper proper twelfth man stuff. It really was, um, and I think it definitely had a massive impact in that first half. And it's it could have been just you know just needed the chances that third goal maybe it could have been very different. Not trying to tease you, obviously, but no, no, just, I think valid point. I think there's yeah, a valid it point. Made, it made a big difference, and it it was very intimidating. You know, you could tell our players were overawed by it a little bit. And and Ian, um, we spoke a little bit, obviously off air after the game yesterday about the atmosphere and stuff like that. It was weird when the Lincoln players were coming down because obviously they come from the stand and stuff like that, and it was <laughs> like it was like I've got no ills with, with Lincoln. I still don't. Um, but when they were coming down the stairs, I was booing them like they were a bunch of Newcastle players. It was like really. Uh, it felt like old Sunderland, didn't it, for the first like forty-five minutes? Ian? I tell you what, yeah, it actually it it, it was funny because when I, you know, visually watching um, the the game, and I don't know if it was Sky's um, their sort of camera angles, but um, the the stadium actually looked like there was more fans in it than there actually was. Yeah, it looked really full, and um, the the noise there itself. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It felt like there was. You know, you know, thirty thousand in there, not not you know ten, and uh, yeah, and, and and we need that. I mean, you can see, you know, that is what will you know hopefully get us over the the, the line. That obviously didn't, you know, yesterday, yeah. but you know, we're all looking forward to having that back. So I think it's kind of my perspective. I am not a happy clapper. I'm definitely not. I'm the kind of person where if I see one slight thing that's wrong, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I'm not having that. Like, as soon as Lee Johnson used the word Pomo, I probably turned on him at that point. Um, no, I'm not that bad. But um, I felt like yesterday, everyone was in the ground and and before and afterwards, like, it was mad. The players came out to, to warm up and this roar just went up like it was Manchester United at home in front of, like, 45,000, 48,000 and we were packed. It, like, it felt like, I mean, it was a big game, don't get me wrong, because I said to the, the, the boy next to me, I says, look, I says, um, if... if like you know, if we have ten thousand in against like Morecambe at home, and that when we were in the Premier League, like you wouldn't hear a, a pin drop because it's. And he went well. First and foremost, the game really matters, and and second of all, like um, we haven't been in for fourteen months, and I was like, yeah, I, I get that completely. But what was great, um, I know, and I really don't want to labour on it. I know fans, in my opinion, let themselves down a little bit yesterday. The the really small uh, vocal minority that kind of had a go at Lee Johnson, which. No matter what your thoughts on Lee Johnson, I don't think that's the right way to to vocalise it. But um, everyone in the stadium, even when Max Power was banging in 40-yard shots like in the last minute, everyone stayed positive and, and behind them. And I think um, there's a lot of people who said that Sunderland fans are negative. They can be the problem for Sunderland. Um, they're hard to play in front of. I tell you what, Tom, I just want to flip this round to the other side. Um, as an opposition fan... Honest question: Do you think at any point yesterday, Sunderland fans might have been a hindrance to the Sunderland team? <laughs> I don't think so. No, actually, I was I half wondered whether that might be the case. And um, we talked about it on the mm-hmm. preview show, didn't we? That if we'd got the early goal, maybe everything would have turned. But no, I was. It was very, very impressive. It was hostile. It was everything you would have wanted as a Sunderland fan. You know, if you were watching on the telly, you'd have been proud of the fans who were in the stadium. And it's about you know, you guys are in a position now where. Johnson's got the summer to make the team his own, but it, they've got to tap into that now, haven't they? Because yeah. I know as a Lincoln fan, you know, that's what the Cowleys did so well. They got the whole city behind the team and we sold out the stadium. You know, we've obviously got a much smaller stadium, but we had 10,000 in with the big bank in one of the stands full and opposition managers and teams in League Two used to say it made a massive, massive difference coming and playing against us with us, the fans behind us and the atmosphere. So if... It's, big, it's a big challenge now, isn't it, for them to tap into what happened yesterday as the potential and kind of reignite that relationship with the fans under Johnson, maybe bringing some new players 
because that could be huge next season for you guys if 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 you can channel that and keep that going. Yeah, I think if we can all get back in the stadium a, a good bulk, you know, not ten thousand, maybe even just twenty five, something like that, and, and everyone's desperate to get back in and, and rolls on like that, I think most teams will falter. I mean, in reality, we won the game yesterday. Yeah. We didn't win it on aggregate because of a really poor first half, but we did win the game. And, and in a league game, that would have been three points. You're up the road and you're, you're happy as Larry with a really good first half performance and a not the best second half, but like we saved a penalty and all that kind of stuff. So if you can channel that into next season, you know, that, that's a big positive. And again, I know things aren't that easy, but um, I'll come on to this later, but there is a, a positive undertone that I'm feeling. Um, Ian, I wanted to touch on the team selection yesterday. Um, at first, it was a bit like, what's he gone for there? But he put in Gucci at right back. Obviously, he went to left back when McFadden got injured. O9 went back in the centre of defence, which I think most people didn't want. O9 actually played quite well. Um, we went a bit more simplistic, 4 4 2, or as Mike Bassett would say, 4 4 fucking 2. Um, <laughs> and just sort of kept it simple, went for it like two big lads up front, got McGeady on the ball. It worked a little bit more simplistic, didn't it? I know, again, we didn't win, but if that's a 90-minute game, we, we did. And I think not overcomplicating it works for us, doesn't it, Ian? Yeah, haha. Yeah. I mean, I'm I mean that's it. You know, you know, you have to look at what what your you know strengths are and actually, you know, play, you know, to them. Um, you know, fair play to um, you know, Johnson for actually putting out such a um their sort of attacking you know, side. I was, I was sort of worried with that. Um, their back four. Uh, you know, Gooch is in no way a right back, and you know there was a few times I thought, oh, he's going to get sent off here. You know, yeah. he was uh, flying, and he was, he was late quite a few times. Um, I, <coughs> I was a little bit worried with Wyke and um, their sort of Stuart up, up, up front, just because, you know, Stuart's a big lad, but I. I have watched him there a bit, you know, prior to coming to, you know, to to us, and he's he's not he's not really, you know, a uh, um, a a ball a ball in in the air. He's not as, he, as much as he's no, a monster. No, he's not no. like a he's not a he's actually better on he's much better on the floor from his time at Ross County. Obviously, that may be different, but from what we've seen of him, he's a lot more on the floor, isn't he? He's he's mobile. He can move. He's quite smart like that. Um, um, and actually, his goal showed that if you get the ball actually in in the the box to his feet, he he can score. So, um, and I was glad to actually see that. Um, so that was good. But I think I think sort of Johnson probably put out the best side there that he could. Um, you know, really. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, like you say, you know, if it was if it was a league match, you know, we won there the game. So, so yeah. No fair play, but. 90 minutes, you take it, wouldn't you? It's kind of, you look, you look back at that. I think someone yesterday mentioned about um, how that second goal sort of killed us and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I was kind of like, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, maybe, it, maybe it sort of did the second goal in the first leg, but like Lee Bridge kind of redeemed himself <laughs> with the penalty save, so I can't criticise him too much. So we'll, we'll blame Flanagan in this case. It's Flanagan's fault for the first goal. I know I said in the first podcast it was Lee Bridge, but you know, whatever. Um I wanted to touch on, on Ross Stewart a little bit, Ian. Uh, I think a lot of people look at Charlie White as the, the talisman. And me personally, I'd like to see him stay. I think he does have limitations, but I think 31 goals is nothing to be sniffed at. I think even as a backup, I'd like to see him stay if he's if he's at the club already. I don't want to have to rebuild a whole forward line. But Ross Stewart actually gave me a lot of hope because I think, I personally think, and the rumours are, I reckon will come to fruition that um, Charlie White's going to go to Middlesbrough. I think it would make sense for all parties, if I'm honest. Um, Because I think probably he wants to be away because he hasn't had the best of three years here, apart from this season. He hasn't got the best of relationship with the fans. No one 100% really trusts him, which is a bit of a shame. Um, But Ross Stewart's performance yesterday gave me a bit of faith that actually we won't need to go and get a number nine if he does go to a place to get that 20, 25 goals, I felt like Ross Stewart was the best player on the pitch yesterday. Ian, am, am I being overzealous in his in his performance? No, no, I think you're right, actually. And I was um, they're sort of disappointed there to see him actually sort of come off later on. Yeah, me um, too. Yeah, haha. Um, but no, no, you're right. I mean, I think what we have to do now is look to um, the, the future. Um 
funnily enough, you know, when we signed him in um, the sort of January, you know, and I was pleased with it, but I was also a bit like, hmm, you know, where has this one sort of come from? You know, because he was doing reasonably well in, in, in sort of Scotland and in a team really that has, um, you know, sort of struggled a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know the you know the 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 backroom staff here obviously you know have done their their sort of homework on them. So I think they had it. I think it was kind of a scouting signing from what what I heard correctly was Ross Stewart. And I think rewind back to six games ago, I thought he was a bit of a lump. Uh, but <laughs> now I've noticed that he is a lot more on the floor. And he, I thought that when he first came, but then obviously he scored his first goal with that mad looping header against Crew, and I was like, all right. Um, one one thing that got me a lot, Tom, um, we've talked about how the first half your your team did, for want of a better phrase, shit themselves a little bit. But like it was every time McGeady got the ball and I thought he didn't get on the ball second half enough. We did kind of go a bit more route one, unfortunately. Um, but first half, I felt like every time McGeady got the ball, I'm not sure, was it Regan Poole as your right back? Mm, yeah. He crapped himself a bit, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I mean, he'd been tasked with the McGeady job in most of the recent games when we've played against you. I think it, in the one all league game, he had that job basically kind of, you know, obviously they're kind of going up head to head, but also given the license to follow McGeady in field if he drifted in field as well. But yeah, I mean, his performance, Regan Poole's performance is slightly emblematic of Lincoln's performance in general. First half, mm. completely lacking in confidence, as you say, completely dominated by McGeady. And in the second half, he stepped up. And as you said earlier, was going on the attack, being being more front foot, winning the ball early um, and starting attacks with Brennan Johnson down the right. Um, so, yeah, you could probably say he kind of summed up the difference in the two performances, really, first, first half and second for us. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, uh, oh, I'm a big McGeady fan. I think anyone who listens to this show, anyone who knows me or spoke to me knows I'm pretty much a McGeady fanboy. Um, however, like, there's a few fans that are kind of, as Ian said, they want to look to the future. They don't want to bank on a 35-year-old and they don't think it's the right decision. There's another set of fans that are very similar to me that goes, you know, you know, another year is not a bad idea considering how influential he's been. Um, from the outside looking in, Tom, do you think Sunderland would be a bit mad not to renew his contract? I think it depends entirely what Johnson wants to do now with his team. Mm-hmm. You know, you talked about Wyke and, and you talked about the tactics and we talked in the first leg, didn't you, about, you know, it was a bit stilted and mm-hmm. it was a bit slow. And, as um, Ian was saying, you kind of went for it, but in a very open and brash way, in a kind of, we're going to go four four two and we're going to do it properly, full throttle. And that obviously suits players like Wyke. It suits players like McGeady because he's got targets in the box to aim for. It suits his game. Um, but if you are going to end up losing Wyke and selling him, there could be a case for McGeady not having a part to play. Not that he's not a good player, not that mm-hmm. he wouldn't be a fantastic addition at that level. He's clearly going to get goals. He's clearly going to get assists. But, and I say this as a Lincoln fan who's watched Michael Appleton come in and change the Danny Cowley team entirely, like literally rip it up and start again. It, in modern football, if you want to play a certain way, you have to get the players in who want to play that system. And so if Johnson wants to go, 442 full full throttle get the 20,000 behind you stadium alike get it up there let's get stuck into them lads then yeah keep McGeady because he'll he can play balls into Stewart and Wyke if he stays if if not you can replace him but I think there could be a case if he wants to you know I was looking at the game after how many players you've got out of contract it could be a big summer in terms of changing changing personnel and that could also lead to a change in style so you just it comes down to what Sunderland want to be now under the new owner with a manager and what, what do you want to be? You know, Lincoln under Appleton, we decided we wanted to be this team that was about playing out from the back because that then in turn means you can go to academies of top Premier League teams and go, hey, we play the right way. Send us your best kids, which is why we've got Morgan Rogers, 18 years old from Man City, far too good for League One already. But... So it's a choice between those two, basically. It's a very long-winded way of saying I'm not quite sure whether McGeady should stay. But it dep- it dep- he, he obviously would have a big role to play. But it's about where the club wants to go, isn't it? 
Makes tons of sense that Tom. I haven't got anything I can even come back at you with that. <laughs> you've you've absolutely yeah. nailed that. But, um, what do, but do you guys? I'd be interested in you know what you what you um what you think because obviously from my, from a Lincoln perspective, there were lots of people post Cowley and in the early days of Appleton when he was making those changes where it wasn't working. You know, we were giving away goals because the players weren't good enough. The players hadn't learned the system. It took some time, and there were lots of fans going, "Oh God, this is rubbish. Let's get back to the." you know, big man up top, more Cowley direct way of playing. Do you guys have any, is it just about getting out of League One or is there a desire for Sunderland to have an ident- have a clear identity? I think it's changed over time. And, and, and Ian, you can, you can kind of let me know if you think I'm right on this, but I feel like when we first came down, it was like, right, let's get out of this and then build when we get into the championship. I think because we've been stuck in this league for as long as we have done, a lot longer than any of us expected and, and we don't really know when we're going to get out of it. I think a lot of people feel very positive because of what's happening in the back room at the moment. Overwhelmingly, it's disappointing and, and like any team, fans are reactionary. Like any team, some are not more reactionary than anyone else. We've just had more opportunity to be negative because the reactionary, the reaction you have to things has generally been negative performances from something or something bad happening. So naturally we might seem a bit more negative because like any football fan, we're reactive. And if things aren't going well, your reaction tends to be a little bit negative. Um, but I think when you sit down and you think about what's going on at Sunderland, there's a big underlying positive tone for me. I feel so much more positive than I did on Wednesday, probably because now it's over. I sit back and I go, well, Speakman's in charge of the uh, recruitment side of things and he's going to be implementing things. And, he brought through Jude Bellingham and stuff like that. He had a lot to do with those sort of players. He's, I mean, Bellingham tweeted him now and again, a 17 year old that's playing in the Champions League and going to probably going to Euro 2020. So you've got to go, well, that's positive. It seems positive. Um, and then I'm not the biggest fan of Johnson, but I understand where he fits in. He's very much modern in a sense. I'd like to see him, unless things were drastically bad at the start of the season, I'd like to see him given at least 18 months before I make a final decision on him. It's not winning me over at the minute, but it's like five months in. So I'm, I'm, I'll give him a, I'll give him time on that. Um, it feels like for me to kind of answer your question in, in the shortest way possible, I think most people would like to see a project. And I think that's where most people, some people, not most, are going, yeah, we want to get out of it because that's always been the plan. We want out of it. And I know people hate Sunderland fans saying this, but like Sunderland are a bigger club than the league that they're in, potentially. So we want to get out of it. Yeah, 100%. However, I think we if we get out of it, we don't want to be like in a position where we're going, oh God, I just want to stay up in the championship. We want to have a, a natural progression where we're bringing in good quality players. And I mean, I seen Appleton's interview yesterday and he was saying there's more to it than just me and the lads on the pitch. You know, there's the recruitment team, there's this, that and the other. And I think, I think Dreyfus, when he's come in, because he's a 23-year-old kid, basically, uh, which is terrifying. He's a billionaire. Um, but he obviously has a handle on the game and the way that he speaks. And he's very much of a new generation of football fan, I think, that lives in the, the false nine and the rotundas or whatever they're called in the football manager positions <laughs> and the, the low block rather than just sitting fucking back. Um which is good, really, because that's where football's going and things change. The only thing that stays constant is change, isn't it? And I think um, it seems that we've got the right set of people in with at least the right ideas. We just hope they implement it. And if they do implement it correctly, there should be a level of getting out of this league and being successful. So I think, and you might disagree with me, and I think a lot of people think it's just about getting out of this league, but it feels a little bit like getting out of this league and having a bit of hope whilst we get out of it, not just snatching a, a, a lucky playoff, I suppose. I can see it from, um, you know, both their sides, really, because um, I am old enough there to remember the last time in um, the League One or, or the third, um, their sort of division, as it were. And and we went down and and we absolutely smashed it, mm-hmm. you know, you know, came straight back up. Um, however, you know, with, with my more, um, their sort of moderate head on, I look at where the teams who... You know, similar teams there to us who have been in in League One, and there is a uh, two for me that really stand out. So that is that is um, uh, there's Southampton mm-hmm. and and Sheffield, um, uh, the United, and 
Leicester they, probably the best example, really. Leicester yeah, as well. Uh-huh. And they took they they took their time. They rebuilt. They put faith in in um the the manager, um and it's paid longer their sort of dividends for them. You know, for them both. For me, regards um their sort of Johnson now now I I I I watched uh, a fair amount of of their Bristol their um their city and when he came in I was absolutely chuffed I thought yeah this is a the guy there for us you know in his four seasons there they got better every single season you know you know playing you know nice nice their football they're a good side there to watch um so I'm all all for giving him you know time and our our side is not his you know team team at all so you know to, to be honest the fact that Practically all of the first team, their sort of squad are out, out of their sort of contract. Actually, gives me hope that we can, you know, rip it up and, you know, start again. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm frustrated with him. I'm I'm not going to deny like he does my head in a little bit. I'm not the kind of person that reacts to a manager that's like using all the modern phrases. But I think I think you've got to give a manager eighteen months to two years before you decide if it's working, which may seem painstaking if it doesn't work. It sucks if it doesn't work. Um, but like I think the last long term manager we really had was probably Steve Bruce. Um, and I didn't realise that I didn't think he was the right man for the job until about two and a half years in. Um but I, I try my best not to make a decision on him. I'm trying my best to do the same with Johnson. I think it's just clouded by the fact that man to man, I don't like that kind of attitude that he has. <laughs> that doesn't make him a bad manager. It doesn't make him a good manager, it just makes him someone that I probably wouldn't want to go for a pint with, which is fine. <laughs> Tom made a point. Um there earlier about the their pl- players that were half. Now, you know, Sunderland is oh god, and I don't I don't want want to say this because I'll end up sounding like a, a the Newcastle fan, okay? But oh god, um, the worst possible <laughs> thing you could sound like. <laughs> <laughs> Sunderland is a the unique their sort of club in mm-hmm. in the the size of it where it is the 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 sort of passion of the fans and the way that the club is actually ingrained in, in you know, where we live and where we are from. Yeah. So, you know, players have to buy in there to that, you know, and what, and, and what we see, see there a lot of the time is that their players who have done well at um, their Sunderland and their leave actually maybe don't do so well at, at, at their other, um, their clubs. I think when I look at our their sort of managers, if I look at the ones who have done well, um, they read, um, they're sort of you know keen, keen obviously um, they're sort of micmac. They are they are arseholes, right? But they are our arsehole. And you know Johnson comes over a bit like you know the management they sort of speak and and all that that sort of stuff. He comes out with a lot of you know, phrases um, and and sort of such like, and I'm like, this guy can be our our their sort of arsehole. You know, you might not like him, but you can buy into to that. Um, you know, when he when he came out after, um, you know, the, the the first leg and really said, you know what, we can go on and we can you know win it, and you know, trying to sound as their sort of positive as he could. Would would you know Jack Ross or 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 sort of Parky have you know been been like that? I don't think so. Good point. Good point. Jack Ross, I think was uh it was the point when Jack Ross sort of turned back on us, wasn't it? At some point when he said about you damned if you do, you damned if you don't. Um, which is when I always think is that I think as soon as you go against the fans, that's when you that's the straw that always breaks the camel's back. Um, I'm sure Gus Poyet won't mind me saying this, but the open letter probably didn't work. Um, I mean, if he does, it doesn't matter. I've said it now, haven't I? So, um, for me, there's there's a certain attitude of for fan like Allardyce, um, Reed, McCarthy. God, I love Mick McCarthy. Um, and Roy Keane were very much attitudes. My, my worry is maybe he's not that kind of attitude. But maybe you've got a point in that sense. Maybe you've kind of changed my mind ever so slightly that he does have a character, whether you like it or not, and that maybe works in our favour. Mm-hmm. Um, 
before we go, obviously, we're trying to make this. Oh, yeah. go on, okay, go again. Okay, so. Point for um, um, their sort of Tom because uh, their Apple and actually comes over like like a bit of an arsehole. and um, <laughs> but you can buy in there to that, can't you? I mean, you know, like you, you know, I look at their sort of Apple and he, and he's ripped and he's got you know the the, the tattoos and all that stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> you, you wouldn't you wouldn't come and ask with his face, would you? Let's be honest. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> I could see as a club that you really want to buy in that the, to someone like that because he's he's right there. He's 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 there in it, and he's they're sort of passionate, and he's going to wind up, you know, other 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 teams' fans and such like, and that and that's what you want, and I, I really feel that's what we need. Yeah, maybe maybe it is. Um, before we go, I've got two things to discuss and we'll try and keep this as short and sweet as we can. I'm kind of curious as to Tom's thought process on this. You've got a minute left. You're sitting back as a Lincoln fan. You're thinking, oh God, oh God, they've got one more chance in this. What are they going to do? The ball lands to max power. What do you, what do you not do, Tom? What, what do you hope that we do? Well, as a Lincoln fan, I was yeah. praying that he went for a long-range strike and I honestly am going to send him a Christmas card because it was, it was the most joyous thing to see that I could possibly have had. Uh, what you didn't, what I didn't want him to do as a Lincoln fan was dink a nice little teasing ball into the box, into just that area between around the penalty area, um, which he had been doing. And there'd been a few balls where Palmer, our keeper, had kind of come or not come, and it you know, makes you nervous. Um, it is that was that was the moment. There was still another minute after that. I think the ref gave it kind of another forty-five seconds, uh, even after that. But yeah, he he did. Um, he'll be in. Uh, all Lincoln fans hearts for a while just for, for that long punt although having said that if you'd stuck it in the top corner that would have been one of the greatest goals of all time but uh, yeah well, I was I was slightly pleased to put it that way I think it made me laugh that someone tweeted straight away and said you could tell Max Power was going Gerard in the back of his head as he hit it because <laughs> everyone it was at our end that and everyone went don't shoot oh for God's sake oh for God's <laughs> sake and like people didn't even get angry they just kind of went nah nah you 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 idiot for doing that. But I, I do think, and I think it's probably best for all parties, that'll probably be the last act of Max Power uh, at Sunderland. And I think, to be honest, that's best for all parties. Um, b- before we do go, um, Grant Ledbetter, obviously, I thought had a good game yesterday. He's been a great servant. I think he's on the verge of retiring. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure he doesn't listen to these shows, but if he does, Grant, you, you've obviously done us immensely proud over the years you have you've got promotions and stuff there you've created some fantastic moments you've been a great pro um and if you are listening mate you're always one of us and, and thanks for trying your very very best on the pitch um with that i'll leave the, the last word with ian because my laptop said my battery's dying which is brilliant um a good time on laptop thanks very much um does it feel like now is a new era yeah yeah absolutely you know, um, owners, their manager, the the fact that we can actually rip up the the the, the squad and you know start start again, and also the fact that our under their sort of twenty threes went from being the worst side ever to, you know, um, absolutely smashing it this year, um, uh, gives me so much the sort of hope that yeah. Yeah, yeah. Josh, next is, Josh Hawkes is next season's player of the year. I'm telling you, I'm calling it now. Um, yeah, wow. Before I let everyone go, obviously, Tom, I don't know if I'll be seeing you next season, but I'm sure we'll stay in touch. Thanks for being a great guest throughout. Um, you have been tremendous. Thank you very much. No problem, mate. I have, I have full faith that you'll be seeing me next season. Uh, I tip back Blackpool at the start, and pff, I mean, that's that's the stupid thing, isn't it? We're, all Lincoln fans are celebrating. We've got to bloody play Blackpool at Wembley now. <laughs> With a... Uh, with, with my podcast head on, I'll be pleased if that happens because we'll get to have you back, Tom. Ian, thanks for joining me throughout the season. And, and to everyone that's obviously listened to the pod, obviously it's been a, a new podcast in, in terms of what's been on. It hasn't been the season we wanted. I wanted a nice celebratory podcast, another preview before Wembley with you know another fan from a League One team. It hasn't been the case, but thanks for tuning in. Thanks for kind of sticking with me. It's not always the easiest thing to do and I, and I don't do it for likes or subscriptions or whatever it is that these people on YouTube do these days. I'm far too old for that um, <laughs> and far too, far too long in the tooth, but um, it does sometimes take effort and time and, and, and it does sometimes get a bit difficult to do when your team's playing pretty shit and on a, a run of form and you're as gutted as the rest of you. When people do listen to it and comment on it and give negative and positive feedback, it, it really matters. So um, thanks for being with us. We will continue it next season when we will win the league. 
I'm going to say with 99 points, not 100, because I will not repeat a Charlie Methven statement. And with that, thanks very much. Yeah.